Hello. Welcome to Postcolonial Space. I'm Masood Raja, and I am just recording this brief introduction to this compilation on post-structuralism. So as you already are probably aware that I have two separate videos on Terry Eagleton's Chapter 4 on post-structuralism. But in this video, I decided to combine the two lectures, which could be convenient for some of you so that you can all watch it in one sitting. But if in case you would like access to the split videos in two parts, those are also available on my YouTube channel. So without further ado, here it is, part one and two of my video on post-structuralism. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to Postcolonial Space. I'm Masood Raja, and today I will be delving into the next chapter of Terry Eagleton, which is on post-structuralism, and it's chapter four in his book. And before I go into the chapter, I must uh, let you know that this is only gonna be part one, and I will probably record a second lecture on the same chapter after this. So today I'll be covering the beginning part of the chapter itself. Now keep in mind that in the beginning of this chapter, Eagleton kind of explains for us our understanding of structuralism, which he discusses in the previous chapter and certain claims associated with Saussurean linguistics. And then builds his argument by offering us one of the most potent critiques of that kind of structuralist linguistics, and which is by Jacques Derrida. So the pages that I'll be talking about today pretty much are all, and he admits it, drawn from Derrida's working on the structuralist assumptions about the text and textuality. And then, as I've mentioned in some of my other lectures too, post-structuralism is not one monolithic movement. It has different schools within it. But in today's part, I'll primarily be discussing Eagleton's take on Jörg Derrida and his work and his assumptions about texts and how to read them. Uh, so on the very first page, page 110, Eagleton starts with a challenge to the Saussurean linguistics. And I quote on page 110, he say, the question he's posing is, what has become of Saussure's idea that language forms a closed, stable system? Now, if you remember my previous lecture, what Saussure had asserted was that the sign itself is arbitrary. The relationship between the signifier and the signified is arbitrary. But once it's accepted within the long, within the system of a language, then it becomes fixed, right? And so that's why he's also saying that Sashore's long suggests a delimited structure of meaning. But where in the language do you draw a line? How do you know that this sign has become stable, right? And that we don't need to look any further, right? And on the same page, he, what he's talking about is that in language also mostly there is an endless play of signifiers. How? Okay, so if you look up a word, right, all you get, so you're looking up a word which is constituted of a signifier and signified. What you get is another word, right, which in itself is a signifier, right? But if I'm looking the meaning of the word to eat, right, and I get another meaning for it, right, then that meaning, even though it's an individual sign, has now become a signified for to eat, right, because I'm looking for the meaning. So when I look for meanings, all I get is more signs, right, and they all, in a way, 
inform each other. So that is what he means by an endless play of signifiers, one signifier trying to explain another signifier and signifiers themselves becoming signified and vice versa. And then there is a great insight on page 111 where he's talking about slippage between the signifier and the signified. How does that slippage happen, right? Now, if there is, right, all we can do is look for meaning, let's say in a dictionary or in a thesaurus, right? And if the world that I'm looking up becomes the signifier and the meaning that are offered to us are signified. So there is no way the meaning can 100% correspond with this signifier, right? And hence, in that process, there can be a lot of slippage. The meaning is not fixed on that sense, right? And then the most important insight on page 111, remember, in Sosur, we had learned that signs also mean something in difference from other signs, right? So what that insight taught us was that meaning is differential. Meaning is one sign meaning something in difference from another sign. Cat is a cat because it's not a hat, right? Dog is a dog because it's not a pony. Meaning is differential. So that means that meaning is not substantial to the sign. Sign itself does not carry its own meanings. We know its meanings because it's not another sign. So meaning is then outside of a sign. That's what he means by meaning is differential and not substantial. Now, if that is one of the stronger assumptions of Saussurean linguistics, that meaning is through differences, then we already are in perilous territory because what that means is that for any sign to announce its meanings or to claim its meanings, it must point us to another sign because it can only mean something in difference from another sign. And so the ultimate question then becomes is, uh, if the meaning is not in the sign itself and is outside of it, then where does it exist? right? That's where difference becomes important, right? Not just in language itself, but in our own ideas of self, right? But keep that in mind. We'll move forward. So then he's briefly touching upon meaning depending on difference of one sign from another, right? But also pointing to another wonderful Deridian insight. Now, in so sure we learned that when signs are placed side by side in a semiological chain, right? They, they mean something in difference from each other, right? And so meaning therefore is always, always through that difference. Now Derridian term for that is difference, right? What, he, what Derrida then teaches us is that reading a semiological chain is a temporal process. We read something over time. In the process of doing that, we are reading and understanding something through difference of one sign from another, but meaning is also always deferred to the next sign, right? So when I move from one sign to the next, I carry a trace of the sign with me to the next sign and that is how I know what that sign means. So for example, I always use this slightly confusing example in my classes. This is a cat, right? It is a sentence. Now, when I read this is a cat, the this in this is a cat is the this in this is a cat because I am already defer deferring its meaning to the is. Right? When I get to the is, I already carry a trace of this in it. So the this is a cat. The is in this is a cat already has the this in it, a trace of it. If that trace is not there, I would not know what that is means, right? But when I reach this is, 
the is itself is pointing me to the next sign. The meaning is held in abeyance. It's in, it's deferred to the next sign, ah, right? So this is ah, the ah in this is a cat, is the ah in this is a cat, because this and is is in it. And it's also pointing, pointing the ultimate meaning to the to the next sign, cat. So the cat in this is a cat is the cat in this is a cat because this is a, the traces of them are in it and then it reverses back. So that is the concept of difference, right? People would give you like really erudite explanations of it, but that's literally what it means. Next, we move to the discussion of the differential nature of the sign on page 112. Eagleton then poses another question. If a sign is what it is not, then where is the meaning? Isn't that an important question, right? And it's a huge question because if meaning is through difference from other signs and there is no substantial meaning of the sign itself, and we've already learned that when we look up a sign, all we get is other signs, right? So if the meaning is not in the sign itself and is constituted through difference, right? Then the meaning is outside of the sign, right? So somehow what is not part of the sign itself is actually more crucial to the construction of the meaning of the sign itself. If we apply it to ourselves, our real life situations, then me, myself, am me, myself, because of my difference from others. So my others then constitute me and not me myself. It completely changes our idea of who we are and this self-constituting human subject because we realize that in order to constitute ourselves as a sign, as Masood Raja, I need something outside of me to construct myself. That is where deconstruction becomes this ethical practice, right? Because the other is not this extreme alterity out there, the other is absolutely necessary to constitute a self, right? That's why Spivak speaks about Derrida in that way. Then we've already discovered it. A sign has the traces of the signs that it has excluded to be itself, right? Now, that is where we are coming to the binary structure of language in so sure, right? Because a sign, how does it constitute itself? How does it stabilize itself through exclusions, right? It must constantly guard against the attack on it on two fronts. And I'll come to that in a minute. So it must constantly exclude or hold at bay the meaning that is infusing itself in it through differences in a, on a linear plane, right? but also on a horizontal plane, because as I am saying these words, there are all these other words arraying there, fighting for, right? So a sign has the traces of the sign that is it, that it has excluded to be itself, right? It can exclude that, but it cannot mean anything without those traces, right? This is a cat, the is is a sign, but it is the is because it's excluding the signs that adjacent to it, but it cannot mean the is in the sentence if the traces of those signs are not in it. So what we learned then, according to Eagleton, is that language is much less stable than classical structuralists had believed, right? That the, the fight is not over after a community within long has decided that this is what we mean when we say this, because even within that agreement, when the sign gets fixed, there can be slippages. And the slippage is on two axes, right? And that's very important for us to understand. So it's on the paradigmatic axis, right? And syntagmatic axis. So the semiological chain, the man cried, is, is the chain, what we would call it is, is, is syntagmatic axis. The paradigmatic axis is, ex, axis is where all the other signs are competing for that intention and can, can at any time replace or send their trace into the semiological chain. So when we say the sign has become unstable, it has become unstable on these two axes, right? And this is an important insight to keep in mind. 
So I hope, you know, by now, I hope you're not totally confused and I haven't lost you. And with this discussion, he's increasingly then moving into Derrida, right? So on page 112, he starts discussing the question of presence. And the question of presence is one of the major questions in Derrida's first book, right, of grammatology. And I'll get to it in a minute. And, but let me read this out. What is he saying? So for such theories, the theories that he has described before this paragraph in the book are the theories that believed in this idea of a centered self where we inwardly made meanings of the things, understood them. Remember the super reader of the structuralist who could read the structure of a text, right? All of them assumed that kind of a reading. But for such theories, he says, it was the function of science to reflect inward experiences or objects in the real world, right? Me being able to name things, to make present one's thoughts and feelings, or to describe how reality was. The whole idea of representation, my ability to explain the world to you or to unravel is, is it, it lies within that belief that when I am present and I say something to you, somehow the chances of you misconstruing me are less because I am present there. And the presence of the meaning within the sign is the same idea, that the sign when, when said or spoken carries its own meanings, right? But what we now realize that is that this idea that meaning is present in the signs is an illusion. We already know that meaning is differential, right? A sign means something because it is not something else. So it is an illusion for me to believe that I can ever be fully present to you in what I say or write. Because to use signs at all entails that my meaning is always somehow dispersed, divided, and never quite at one with itself. And the reason they are not never quite one with itself is because of the slippage in the process of signification itself, but on those two axes that I talked about, and also because signs mean something because of their difference from other signs. Not only my meaning indeed, but me, since language is something I'm made out of, rather than merely, merely a convenient tool I use, the whole idea that I am a stable entity must also be a fiction. How do we maintain that fiction, right? Through erasure, through maintaining a binary structure of me and him, but even that structure is maintained through differences, right? But the problem of presence in Derrida is this privileging of presence, you know, because in his book of grammatology, he is saying um, in the Western culture has traditionally been um, logocentric and that is what he calls a metaphysics and logocentric in a sense that speech has always been privileged over writing. Now, remember that whole discussion uh, of why is speech privileged over writing? Because speech is one removed from the ideal form. So the idea coming from Plato that, so when I'm speaking, I'm drawing the signs from an ideal form and expressing them. So it's just that one remove, whereas writing was a copy of a copy. But in of grammatology, Derrida basically says that the structure of speech is actually inscription because we are inscribing something. And if that is that, then writing is actually, it comes before speech, right? So, so the Western logocentricism so phono, and I'll quote here, just as Western philosophy has been phonocentric, phonocentric meaning privileging speech, centered on the living voice and deeply suspicious of script. So also it has been logocentric, committed to a belief in some ultimate word, presence, essence, truth or reality, which will act as the foundation of all our thoughts. So what is this logocentricism, right? There are two ends to it, right? Transcendental signifier, right? And the transcendental signified. 
So the transcendental signifier in this sense is something outside of language that can control meanings for us. The concept of God, a scripture, a holy book, right? And the transcendental signified then is the other end of speech or writing where we reach the end of meaning, right? right? But suddenly we realize post sashorian linguistics and post-structuralism that there is no transcendental signifier, right? because all we have is signs upon signs upon signs, and there is no transcendental signified. We never reach the end of meanings. Our understanding is usually at best provisional because all we get is a sign for another sign, meaning through difference, right? Then, I'm going to the next slide, sorry. Then he explains, Eagleton starts explaining to us one of the major schools of post-structuralism, which is deconstruction, okay? And he gives us certain claims which come from Derrida. On page 114, we get, there is no concept which is not embroiled in an open-ended play of signification shot through with the traces and fragments of other ideas. We already talked about it. You know, a sign is always contingent on one, on two axes, right? On the paradigmatic axis and uh, the syntagmatic axis. Sign is also um, unstable because it doesn't carry its own meanings. It relies on something outside of it to construe itself, to make meanings. So. Given that in mind, in very simple terms, the way Eagleton describes deconstruction is deconstruction is the name given to the critical operation by which such uh, binary oppositions. Now remember, Sashurian linguistic also worked on these binary oppositions, right? Uh, since a, a sign means something through a difference, most of the times that is expressed in a binary structure, man, woman, you know, white, black, civilized, uncivilized, right? This binary structure. Now, what deconstruction does is, it's the name given to the critical operation by which such binary oppositions can be partly undermined or by which they can be shown partly to undermine each other in the process of textual meaning. Now, Furthermore, deconstruction has grasped the point that the binary oppositions with which structuralism tends to work represent a way of seeing typical of ideologies. Ideologies draw rigid boundaries between what is acceptable and what is not. So in a way then one form of post-structuralism is deconstruction, right? And deconstruction is when you pick up an established binary structure, man, woman, which is hierarchically maintained and almost thought fixed, right? And then work on it in a way where you're not saying this is superior or this is not, where, where what you do is you weaken the hard line between the binary, where you can either prove that part of man is also woman and part of woman is also man and disrupt that binary structure, right? And if you have done that within the larger structure of culture, then you have opened a space, a political space actually for more possibilities for one end of the binary. Another thing that happens in the binary structure is that one end of the binary is always privileged, right? Socially and politically. So if you disrupt that binary of gender, of class, of region, north and south, of color, of civilized and all. So what you are then doing is you, you are maybe making the sign more democratic, but actually impacting the world itself. Think of it, so much of what we have accomplished, at least here in America, is based in disrupting the binary structure. The rights of gays and lesbians and transgender people absolutely depended on on, on eliminating the hard binary of male, female, right? Um, racial binary structures, white, black, brown, whatever you want to call it, right? That binary structure needed to be disrupted 
for people like me and others to claim that we are equally as human and equally as civilized as anyone else and hence should also have the same rights as uh, as our counterparts all of that was maintained through a binary structure in the culture right the hierarchies are maintained through the binary structure right? for example uh, this month uh, you know women all over the world on march 8th marched in the streets right to be acknowledged as equal to their male counterparts right and if you look at the response in the Orat march or women march in pakistan coming from the conservative circles absolutely wants to maintain the binary structure maybe divinely ordained or whatever their claims are because these people mostly men are frightened at the prospect of that binary structure being destabilized so politics even on the streets then are doing that kind of deconstructive work claiming the public sphere for women but in the process the first thing that must be done is destabilization of the inherently stable binary structure right so how does Derrida do it Derrida's own typical habit of and I'm quoting of reading is to seize on some apparent apparently peripheral fragment in the work a footnote a recurrent minor term or image a casual illusion and work it tenaciously through to the point where it threatens to dismantle the opposition oppositions which govern the text as a whole right the tactic of deconstructive criticism that is, is to show how texts come to embarrass their own ruling system of logic and deconstruction shows this by fastening on the symptomatic points the aporia or impasses of meaning yeah, i looked up emporia for you so uh, you can look it up here it's available you know on wikipedia but or impasses of meaning where text gets into trouble come unstruck offer to contradict themselves okay so let me unpack it you know um I have a couple of more slides maybe I think this is the last slide so I'm going to go to the full screen now and see um, if you can see me better so let's go back to that claim now what deconstruction does according to Eagleton what Derrida does is first of all takes up a text and sees what what its logical claim is what is a text claiming to be then he will find something in the text the idea is if the text is offering itself as a logical whole right then how do you dismantle it you can't and this is this comes from derrida's plato's pharmacy where he says is the purpose is not to embroider on to the fabric but to find its weave the histos of it and, and unravel it so what does he mean by that what does he mean what he means by that is the deconstruction in opposition to what you me and everyone else does right embroiders upon the text here is upon that i'm going to read here are two theoretical tools i'm going to pick up these two theoretical tools and then write meanings onto this text with that insight what he's saying is no 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 the way of doing it is to work with the text but with the weave of the text now in order to work with the weave of the text you have to consume the whole text right only then you can understand what is it claiming to be right and then find that one place Derrida calls it the navel of the text right find that one place where the text exceeds its own logic where it cannot sustain itself and run it through the text right and if you do that you have unraveled the very fabric the very truth claims of a text right in plato's pharmacy he does that by using the term pharmacon right and he he first of all picks up one of the neglected um Te uh, dialogues of Plato and he starts with for 2000 years this has been sitting here no one has considered it important some people thought it was Plato's 
Later work, he was too old. Some people thought he was too young. But here, let me read this peripheral dialogue, Phaedrus, to make a point, right? Then here is a mention of Pharmacia, right? No one paid attention to it. Why is it there? Why is it that this is the only dialogue that the only dialogue in Plato in which Socrates comes out of the city? What has brought him in out, out of the city? Pharmacon, right? A speech that Phaedrus is carrying, which he wants Socrates to read. So by running the concept of pharmacon through the entire essay, Derrida isn't just proving that writing is before speech. What he's also saying is, here is the method, right? You pick up something that has been considered completely unimportant or peripheral to a text, and you first of all point out that this is quite significant, and that if we tease it out, then we can undo the structure of meaning built around the text, right? I always use, like, uh, uh, carefully though, but an example, like from the third, uh, from the Gospel of John, right? Where he says, you know, and God sent his only begotten son to his people. People just gloss over it, right? If you wanted to deconstruct it, you could basically say, can there be a God, first of all, who has his own people? Aren't all the people God's people? But let's just assume that we want to say, OK, can there be a God that has his own people that, that presupposes that there are certain people that are not his own people? And then if he sent Jesus to his own people, right? if he came to his own people, it already presupposes that he had predecided that some people are not his own people. So there goes the claims of universality of Jesus's message and the entire Catholica, right? You're not bringing something outside. You're not saying here is a new gospel. We are finding you are working with the text itself against its universal claim that it is a universal text and then saying these ideas are irreconcilable, right? Just as when I argue with my Muslim friends, right? Lovingly, when they point to me about women not being equal and all, and they point me to the Quranic verses, I, I say, fine, okay, um, do you think that if woman is supposed to, uh, you know, bear half witness compared to man and should not be considered that, well, when she commits a heinous crime, would her punishment be half? And they're like, no she will pay the same price as men. So my argument then is you can't have it at both ends. You can't treat the subject of woman as half of men in one instance, right? And then when it comes to she being punished for her sins, consider her equal to a man. It is irreconcilable. That's you arguing from within a text itself, right? Whether you can convince people or not, these are just my examples. I don't mean to hurt anyone's feelings, but the most effective argument then always comes from within a text, right? So in this first part of his chapter, Eagleton is mostly explaining to us Derrida and deconstruction. And the aspects of it that he has covered is the instability of the text, the signs constantly vying for meaning, that there is no point of arrival, there is no transcendental signified, we never read the, reach the end of meaning, all we get is more signs, right? And that signs mean through difference, the sign is differential and not substantial, but meaning is also deferred to the next sign and the next sign, and that is Derrida's concept of difference, right? and that each sign carries the trace of the sign before it on this axis, but also other signs competing with it on the, you know, uh, vertical plane, right? And so overall, by the end of this section, what we have learned is certain challenges to the structure of language itself and the binary structures, and then how Derrida works with the text but with the purpose of finding that one place in the text where the text cannot sustain its own logic 
and running it through the text to destabilize it. We have also learned that that act disrupting of binaries is not just an academic exercise, but most of the revolutionary politics, more, most of the change that happens in the world is by challenging those strict hierarchical binary structures, right? And that is the significance of deconstruction in the real sense of the word. So this is all I have today for part one of Eagleton's chapter four on post-structuralism. I hope it has clarified certain things for you. I will come back with more of the same chapter on post-structuralism in my next lecture. Until then, if you have any questions, please do post them um, in the comment section. And if you like what I do on this channel, please do subscribe. Um, I would love to have you as my regular friends on this channel. And that's all from me for now. Thank you so much. I will see you next time. And until then, stay safe, stay indoors, right? Take care of yourself and your family and peace and love. Hello. Thank you so much for joining me today. I hope you all are taking good care during this pandemic and not just taking care of yourself, but also everyone around you by actually distancing yourself from others and being careful. Uh, in this lecture today, I'll build on my part one of my lecture on Terry Eagleton's chapter four on post-structuralism. And I hope to conclude the discussion of post-structuralism in this lecture. Now, Eagleton spends a lot of time in this part of the chapter, the second part of the chapter. He dwells for quite a few pages on Roland Barthes' work. And one of the reasons that he himself explains is because in Barthes' work, you can see the transition in one scholar and critic's work from being a staunch structuralist to eventually becoming a post-structuralist. And that is what he traces through a discussion of Barthes' work. But what we learn in the process also is you know, what is involved other than Derrida, who's uh, part in the post-structuralist movement I already talked about in the first lecture. But how does it happen in Barthes? What are the material causes for it? What are the ideological or philosophical reasons behind that? And that transition Eagleton explains it on page 116. He says, we have moved, in other words, from the era of structuralism to the reign of post-structuralism, a style of thought which embraces the deconstructive operations of Derrida, which I've already talked about, and you can look up that video and watch it. The work of the French historian Michel Foucault, right? Foucault is really important, especially the late Foucault and the writings of the French psychoanalyst Lacan and of the feminist philosopher and critic Julia Kristeva. I have not discussed Foucault's work explicitly in this book. That's what Eagleton is saying. But what he suggests is that this chapter would have not been possible without a knowledge of Foucault. And I'll bring it up in my discussion. And then he goes on to explaining Barth's significance to post-structuralism. Right. So what Foucault is saying is that the early Barth was a staunch structuralist. Right. We talked about him in my first lecture. Right. But towards as his career develops, right, his chick playful neologistic prose style signifies a kind of excess of writing over the rigors of structuralist inquiry. Right. And it is an area of freedom with, where he can sport play, you mean, partially released from the tyranny of the meaning. And this is the Barth who has fun with his writing. Uh, 
He's no longer doing some kind of a technical analysis of a structure of a poem as we read his later works beyond mythologies and beyond his early work on structuralism. We find out that Barth is increasingly writing in a more creative fashion, in a way that his writing about other people's writing itself becomes a work of art, is creative and is open-ended, right? And that's the part that uh, that Eagleton is emphasizing here. Okay, so Barthes describes what he means by a healthy sign, and this is discussed uh, by Eagleton on page one seventeen. So, as we know, right, what was structuralism? A structuralism, according to Eagleton, was a move into language, right? The material causes, and I will have a slide for it later, were, were obviously that the world in which these people and writers existed was no longer the world they thought it ought to be. You know, industrialism had happened, people, the reality was fragmented. That's why modernism happens, right? And the critics then move into the text into the structure because that's a safe place. That's where they can be brilliant. They can write about things which does not have to worry about what's happening in the world. And for Barth then a healthy sign, right? Language is Barth's theme from beginning to end. That is Eagleton about Barth's work. And in particular, the Saussurian insight that the sign is always a matter of historical and cultural convention. We talked about it, how the sign is decided by the convention. The healthy sign for Barth is one which draws attention to its own arbitrariness, which does not try to palm itself off as natural but which in the very moment of conveying a meaning communicates something of its own relative artificial status as well. So what is at stake in understanding what is a healthy sign, right? The only time a sign is terroristic in Barth's uh, vocabulary or not healthy, let's say, is when it is offering your itself to you as complete, as natural, right? And what is at stake in that understanding is because if we believe that science can represent the real, a definite real, a plausible real, then people can build huge mythologies around it. Think of the binary structure of the sign, man, woman, now, if we read the binary as it represents itself as stable, then there are certain attributes associated with, with man. If we buy them as natural, then that hierarchy is already established. And that is an unhealthy sign because it palms itself as natural and then accepts for us to give it our allegiance, right? Because we think that it represents the real, right? Uh, for the, the nation, right? Nationalism. If a nation state offers itself as natural, as not, not a sign that has been constructed, that is ideologically produced, if we buy into those imperatives, then we can have what you could call an organistic view of nation, nation as an organism, right? And build huge vocabularies of destruction on that. That is what he means by an unhealthy or terroristic sign. And what is a sign that offers itself as unstable, as not complete, maybe infused with other signs? Where does it, what kind of a writing, writing we need for that, right? And that's where we enter this debate between realism and modernism. Now, what, what were realism's claim? You know, m more importantly, the American realists uh, claimed that, yeah, there should be some imagination, but by and large, an author should represent reality as it is. Now, is it possible to do so? Probably not. But if we are reading a realistic work, it is filled with unhealthy signs because it is offering itself as a representation of reality. Compared to that, a modernist text, 
ideally speaking, offers itself as deeply crafted. No modernist author would tell you this was just me sitting down and jotting down whatever came to my mind. A modernist text announces itself as deeply crafted, right? It asks for an erudite knowing reader. Right? So that means that the text as a symbol already is pointing to its own artificiality its own createdness, right? And that is at stake. That's why modernism is the period which ideally works better for post-structuralism. But then going back to the problem with the unhealthy signs, signs that offer themselves as natural, right? Uh, on page 117, Eagleton says, signs which pass themselves off as natural, which offer themselves as the only conceivable way of viewing the world, are by that token authoritarian and ideological. It is one of the functions of ideology to naturalize social reality, to make it seem as innocent and unchangeable as nature itself, right? Any time a science system offers itself as such, think of it this way, all religious metaphysics, right? All claims, religious claims offer themselves as natural signs. And when we buy into them, the social and cultural hierarchies that they put in place are the ones we live our lives through, right? Even though the interpretations, the representations is ideal, ideological, but no sacred text tells you I am an ideological text. It says I am the truth. And that, you know, I had that point there, realism versus modernism I talked about. So realism in literature offered itself as a representation of the real, right? We were supposed to believe that this is reality being passed down to us. Whereas in modernism, as we enter a modernist text, we already know it's a deeply crafted text and it's indeterminate, right? So in a way then Eagleton would eventually claim that post-structuralism would not be possible without modernism because what the post-structuralists do, what Barth is doing in his work is actually a form of modernism, not offering conclusive understandings of thing, not offering, you know, a monolithic understanding of thing, right? Having a lot of ambivalence, but in the process of criticism, creating an open-ended work, right? So the realist or representational sign then is for Barthes essentially unhealthy. It effaces its own status as a sign in order to foster the illusion that we were we are perceiving reality without its intervention. So I already talked about it, right? Whenever something offer its, offers itself as natural, right? If it exists in language, it has been constructed, we already know that, but so many times there are certain terminologies, certain thought systems, certain ways of living that offer themselves as natural right? Being a woman, being a man, gender, all these. And when that happens, that for Barth is an unhealthy sign, right? So based on that then, Barth also then talks about what kind of texts are there. So there is a readable text, a text that you read and it offers itself as the truth. But then Barth suggests that there are also texts that are writable, right? In one of his works, uh, in Balzac's story, uh, the literary work, Eagleton says, is now no longer treated as a stable object or delimited structure. Now that would have been the case in structuralism, right? And the language of the critic has disowned all pretensions to scientific objectivity. The most intriguing texts for criticism are not those which can be read, but those which are writable, scriptable, right? Texts which encourage the critic to carve them up, transpose them into different discourses, produce his or her semi-arbitrary play of meaning, the work against the work itself. The reader or critic shifts from the role of consumer to that of producer. And that is one attribute of post-structuralism 
especially with Barth, and that is that you read a text, but in the process of reading and writing about it, right, what you create is not necessarily a controlled meaning of the text, but another creative work that plays with the text, that lays it open, sometimes points out something that might have been missed. Uh, another great example of that outside of Barth, of course, is Derrida's reading of Phaedrus, right? I mentioned it in my previous lecture. That is Derrida reading one of Plato's dialogues as a writable text, because in the process of reading it, he says, here, if you read it like this, this is where I can take that text. So that's probably what Barth also means by the writable text. What are some of the qualities of the writable text? The writable text, usually a modernist one, has no determinate meaning, no settled signifiers, but is plural and diffuse, an inexhaustible tissue or galaxy of signifiers, a seamless weave of codes and fragments of codes through which the critic may cut his own errant path. There are no beginnings and no ends, no sequences which cannot be reversed, no hierarchy of textual levels to tell you what is more or less significant. I mean, think of a classic modernist text, think of Ulysses, right? Joyce's Ulysses. When you read it, it doesn't give you a single meaning. It doesn't even tell you what it's doing. You write about the text, your experience of reading the text writes what's happening in a text. Similarly, any of the works of Beckett, right? Um, you know, any of other stream of conscience authors, all of these texts are not giving us a delimited story or controlled signifiers, right? These are all writable texts, but what Eagleton is also establishing here is this connection between post-structuralism and modernism. Then Barth also suggests in one of his work, right, that's where when he's trying to define that we should no longer deal with works, we are dealing with text, that movement from the text, work to text, and he says all literary texts are woven out of other literary texts. Not in the conventional sense that they bear the traces of influence, but in the more radical sense that every word, phrase, or segment is a reworking of other writings which precede or surround the individual work. And that idea about intertextuality, intertextuality in the same temporality with other texts beside the text, but also historical, diachronic intertextuality, that destroys this idea of a defined, delimited work and opens it up to as a text right within an array of all the other texts which could have been openly, could have influenced it, which could have, you know, uh, maybe unconsciously influenced it. The psyche of the author comes into play too, but mostly that a writable text is intertextual and it does not palm itself as natural or realistic and it does not give us neat solutions and post-structuralist way of writing about text also then is a play with the text. It's playful, it's writing about the text but not necessarily telling us here is the crux of that meaning. I mean think of it that way. I was trained in Pakistan in my early education and the way we were trained to read literature was we were supposed to produce in our exam and test as to what a story meant. That means that when our teacher taught us, they gave us solutions. This is what this story means. And we internalize that logic. Even now I get questions from people, you know, can you tell us how post 9-11 identities work, right? How can we apply post-colonial theory to it? We don't need a specific work that deals with it. We can pick up any theoretical concept and apply it to it. Similarly, any novel or book that we read, we don't need to look for one meaning, right? But that's what I was trained to do. And I had to break that habit and, and make my reading of text more you know, indeterminate, more open. And that's what he's talking about here. Um, 
you know, about a writable text. And the movement from the work to text, Eagleton talks about it on page 120, says the movement from structuralism to post-structuralism is in part, as Barth himself has phrased it, a movement from work to text. It is a shift from seeing the poem or novel as the closed entity equipped with definite meaning, which it is, which it is the critic's task to decipher, to seeing it as irreducibly plural an endless play of signifiers which can never be finally nailed down to a single central essence or meaning. Now, what does that remind you of? If you remember my first lecture, this endless play of signifiers, Derrida talks about that in the language, right? Now we are applying it to a text, right? That just as in language, when we, we look at one sign, that sign is arrayed within an endless, chain of signification. Similarly, a text, when read by a post-structuralist critic, is also open-ended, right? And we can write about it in different ways, right? And we don't have to try to see what is its core meaning and what is it's trying to say. Now, Barth develops in one of his works, right, um, a, a method which might seem like structuralism, but it is not, right? So he reads in one of his works a text by developing certain lexes or small units. So by dividing a text into small units, and then he says, here are five codes that I'm going to use to read this text. So the first one is uh, prioritic or narrative code, and that's a um, code a hermeneutic code concerned with the tale's unfolding enigmas, a cultural code which examines the stock of social knowledge on which the work draws, a semic code dealing with the connotations of persons, places, and objects, and a symbolic code charting the sexual and psychological relations set up in the text. And this is on page 120. But Eagleton does give us a clarification here. He says, you know, now the division of the text into units is more or less arbitrary, right? And the five codes are simply five selected from an indefinite possible number. They are ranked in no sort of hierarchy, but applied sometimes three to the same lexi in a pluralistic way. And they refrain from finally totalizing the work into any kind of coherent sense, right? And that's where it becomes post-structuralism. Had these codes been given to us as these five possible codes, I mean, think of it like uh, what in my lecture on structuralism was, like Jacobson's six elements of communication, all they have a certain hierarchy, they all needed to be applied. But here, what he's saying is, even though Barth is def developing these five codes, he is not also creating a hierarchy. And these are not the only five codes that he's applying. So there is plurality. There is a degree of freedom involved in applying these codes to the chosen text. And for Barth, then, the text, the text, Barth argues, is less a structure than an open-ended process of structuration. And it is a criticism which does this structuring. OK, so previously, we believed that the text holds all the meanings. And we need to figure out how it is structured and plotted against a structure. What Barth is saying as a post-structuralist is that the, that the text is not necessarily a structure, but a process of structuration. And that structuration is the role of the critic, right? the critic comes in and lends a, gives a structure to the text. And that structure is, how am I going to read this text, right, as a critic? And that act then takes away the primacy of the structure which we were going to implot on a text and gives the critic the creative possibility of creating new meanings, of finding new ways of interacting with the text and reading it. So 
Furthermore, on page 121, it is in fact the literary movement of modernism. And now here Eagleton is explaining what prompted post-structuralism. Modernism, which brought structuralist and post-structuralist criticism to birth in the first place. Some of the later works of Barth and Derrida are modernist literary texts in themselves because they are indeterminate. They don't take one position. They are polyvocal if you read them. But they are richly ambiguous, he says. There is no clear division of post-structuralism between criticism and creation. Both modes are subsumed into writing as such. So if you've read your Derrida, and if you read later Barth, you will know that the way they write about text in itself is creative. And it's very modern because it doesn't take just one or other stance. It leaves all the possibilities open, right? Now, then Eagleton, for some reason, on page 121, goes on to explain, you know, how did structuralism come to be, right? And he gives us certain material causes for it. And part of it was the rise of the 20th century industrial economy, the rise of bureaucracy, the, the taken over of the public spaces by, you know, media and others. And uh, just as modernism was then escaped from that fractured reality to the integrity of the text itself, the structuralist also, because of these anxieties, move into the text, into the structure, and that move into the language is, Eagleton sees it as a move to seek some security within something that can be, you know, uh, totally away from the world in which these people existed, right? And, and here were some of the questions that these people asked. Europe was felt to be in the throes of deep crisis. How was one to write in an industrial society where discourse had become degraded to a mere instrument of science and positivism, right? What audience was one to write for in any case, given the saturation of the reading public? by a mass profit hungry anodyne culture. These were some of the questions that drove the modernists to writing the way they wrote, right? And these were the questions Eagleton says, the historic, these were the historical conditions of modern writing, which foregrounded the problem of language so dramatically. I mean, think of it, the wasteland, Ulysses, Pretty much a lot of all the works of Hemingway, Faulkner, Virginia Woolf. What is the most, Kafka, the earliest of all, what is the most significant aspect of their writing? You know, what they do with language, right? How do they make language so flexible, but also so indeterminate, right? The question, as someone would say, some scholars, of course, do say, in modernism then becomes who is saying what and can I trust it, right? The questions are epistemological, right? We don't ask that question in realism, right? We just read a novel, Maggie, the Girl of the Streets, and we are saying this is going to be the story of Maggie, the Girl, girl of the Streets. When we pick up Ulysses, I have no idea what it's about. It doesn't announce itself as such. So that emphasis. So then structuralism to post-structuralism on page 122, then Eagleton gives us his explanation of it. Structuralism is best seen as both a symptom of and a reaction to the social and linguistic crisis I have outlined and I talked about it. It flees from history to language. For baths of the pleasures of the text, a book that Barth publishes in 1970, all theory, ideal, ideology, determinate meaning, social commitment have become, it appears, inherently terroristic. And writing is the answer to them all. Writing or reading as writing is the last uncolonized enclave in which the intellectual can play, savoring the sumptuousness of the signifier in heady disregard of whatever might be going on in the Elysee Palace or the Renault factories. In writing, the tyranny of structural meaning could be momentarily ruptured and disclosed by the free play of language, right? So for Barth then, 
this world over determined by larger systems right against which the largest rebellion of students and everyone has already failed in 1968 right if you think of the student uprising in solidarity with workers how it is brutally put down at the same time the other alternative of Stalinism is being dismantled. We have suddenly learned that this was not the utopia that we Marxists had thought about, that Stalin had literally killed millions of people, right? So all these larger movements have failed. So our response, of course, intellectual response to that is there is nothing reliable, anything that offers itself as a larger system becomes suspect. A, an all-encompassing system becomes suspect. I mean, think of all the intellectuals who leave the French Communist Party and go and do their things. You know, even Althusser, I think, leaves it, but Foucault and others. And then what they start focusing on is what Deleuze would call the micro-resistances, right? Because the larger, the grand narrative of change is no longer possible, has failed, right? Post-structuralism is then that this emphasis on the smaller aspects of the narratives, the petite narratives, right? So people like Derrida working on disrupting the binary oppositions, people like Barth and others moving on to studying texts, Foucault especially, Foucault, the later Foucault, talking about that we are now in an age where experts have the opinions about, they have the knowledge and they need to work, Foucault and Deleuze, they need to work in solidarity with uh, workers, with the prison prisoners. The fights can be anywhere, right, as long as there is a fight against power. Foucault's theory of power that is diffuse all of that is a production of this movement into language and then beyond that this opposition to larger structures determining and even larger utopias so historical background to post structuralism in was a post structuralism was a product of that blend of euphoria and disillusionment from 1968 the student movement fails all such systemic thought was now suspect as terroristic Conceptual meaning itself, as opposed to libidinal gestures and anarchist spontaneity, was feared as repressive reading for the later Barth is not cognition, but erotic play. The only forms of political action now felt to be acceptable were of a local, diffuse, and strategic kind, right? And that's significant. Um, this emphasis on local, of course, it comes from Deleuze as well as on Foucault. And that gives us the idea of power, right? There, It's not architectural. According to Foucault, then power is diffuse, right? The resistance coming from Deleuze becomes rhizomatic, right? And the idea is that I fight over here, you fight over here. We can have different politics. We can have different solidarities, right? But the possibility of having a large monolithic movement against capital or anything else is not possible, right? Then after the disc discussion of Barth, um, Eagleton goes to towards a critique of American, Anglo-American use of deconstruction. What basically primarily he's saying the Yale School and others he's saying is that these people are actually doing the kind of deconstruction that Derrida himself would have not understood or approved. For Derrida, when he does deconstruction, the, you know, what he accomplishes is disrupting the binaries and destroying the truth claims of a text, right? Or the binary structure of a larger discourse. What these critics, according to Eagleton, focus on is the concept of undecidability of the sign itself, which is a Deridian insight, right? Because the sign itself is undecided and we need to figure out what decides it, right? And then what they have done with Derrida is they have completely depoliticized it. Of course, Derrida is never openly political other than his book on Marx, right? 
but what they have made the work of the critic is this this circular erasure of i am going to find this thing in the text and make it undecidable until someone else comes along and reads my text and makes it undecidable and exercise in undecidability that is what eagleton talks about which has no political function right and he names a few critics you can read them in the chapter but that's his critique of american deconstruction as it is practiced in the american Acad academy he also towards the end of the chapter moves into feminism now if it's 70s right so he's talking about probably the rise the, the end of the second wave feminism and the beginning of the first wave feminism and especially kristeva's work right and that how is it that the feminists themselves are rereading the structural texts of the binary structures right and then using that knowledge to disrupt that now throughout the chapter also he also points out the academic nature of post structuralist movement and their claims because when post structuralists are escaping from reality and reading texts more brilliantly things are happening in the world you know most of the developing nations that we call right now are fighting their fights for freedom some of them are mobilizing marxist ideologies so what these western intellectuals have kind of abandoned is still mobilizing people enough to come together and to win their freedoms that is already happening so in so many ways our understanding of modernity and structuralism and post structuralism is very eurocentric and thankfully eagleton points to that right just as we are talking about the failure of 1968 you know there are people in vietnam fighting an empire right and eventually defeating it right some of them happen to be marxist right so overall then by the time we finish this chapter the first part of the chapter was about he eagleton explaining derrida's work which you can of course uh, watch in my first lecture on this topic and then he spends a lot of time on barth and the reason i explained he spends a lot of time on barth is because you can track the transition Barth's own transition from a structuralist to a post-structuralist, and then towards the end of the novel, there is a critique of deconstruction as practiced in the American Academy, and a general critique of this mindset, which tells us nothing can be political anymore, and that we all we can do is just read the text more brilliantly. Of course, being a Marxist, Eagleton is opposed to that view, and then towards the end of the chapter, he talks about. briefly about the feminist movement second wave and third wave and their attempts at destroying the binary structure of the the patriarchy and then he tells us now we will see how consciousness works in material conditions and that's why the next chapter is psychoanalysis so i hope this was useful to you uh, there is no way for me to cover every chapter in great detail so of course if you have any questions please send them my way and i'll try to answer them and if you would like me to add something more to this body of work i'll be happy to do that meanwhile please stay healthy take care of yourself um do that social distancing right but help each other be kind and generous with that thank you so much and as always peace and love